for each kernel. So we had uh, k is equal to 1 on 4 pi t naught minus t to the n plus 1 over 2 uh, times e to the minus uh, x naught minus x squared on 4 t naught minus t. And we had uh, rho uh, <coughs> was equal to square root of 2t naught minus t uh, times k. And then we had that d dt of uh, the integral over the surface at time t of rho d mu with respect to the measure at time t was equal to minus integral h plus the normal component of the logarithm of uh, rho and the I can, because k is defined on all of uh, Rn plus 1, I can write this here, or, I, or you can write k if you like, because it's the same. Squared uh, rho d mu. And uh, now, <coughs> the question then is, uh, and it was posed by you, um, what happens if the right-hand side is zero? Now, <coughs> so the question is which surfaces satisfy uh, H equals uh, minus gradient nu in the ambient space uh, of log K, which is, if you take the logarithm here, uh, it's just this term, right? So taking minus the gradient, the normal gradient, you get just here um, x, the inner product of x minus x naught times the unit normal divided by t, 2 times t, uh, two t, t naught minus t. Right? This is the equation uh, that a surface has to satisfy if the right-hand side is equal to zero. Well, let me show you. Of course, if you just stare, stare at it for a moment, you find out that this is satisfied by the uh, uh, sphere. If you pick the radius right, depending on t naught, and uh, see a sphere centered at x naught, or also by a cylinder um, with the right radius, if the point x naught is on the axis of the cylinder. So <clears throat> we have some solutions that satisfy this. There's the shrinking sphere, and there is the uh, shrinking cylinder that satisfies these equations. Um, <clears throat> so what is special about them? And it turns out they are all self-similar shrinking solutions. So let me show you that whenever you have a solution of this equation, you get a self-similar shrinking solution. Suppose the initial surface, Mn0, satisfies the equation H equals, and let's take x0 to be the origin, x times nu, this is the position vector, divided by 2 on t0, and then let's just shrink it, then <coughs> So F naught is the map uh, from Mn into Rn plus 1, uh, satisfying this equation. And then I should write here the position vector F naught. Right? And then set F of Pt to be, well, we should shrink this surface. So with what factor should we shrink it? <coughs> well, the right scaling seems to be to take this quantity to the one half and take f zero of p. And then when we compute ddt of f of p of t and take the normal component of that, well, <coughs> then we get 
from here, we just get um, uh, minus uh, 1 over 2 t naught minus t to the 1 half, right, times f 0 at p, and the whole thing is multiplied by nu, but we know what f 0 p times nu is, this is equal to <coughs> h over 2 t, h times 2 t 0, this is uh, h times uh, 2 t 0, um, ah, okay, we should rescale this in such a way that at time uh, t 0 we get the same surface back, right? So. I have to also divide by 1 on square root of 2 t0 so that I get the same surface for t equals 0. And then here I get, um, <coughs> I have to put in this factor times 1 on square root of 2 t0. And then this is equal to, uh, because of this equation, uh, this is equal to minus um, minus uh, uh, one on. Uh, hang on, I have to careful f zero p. So I get. Um, let's just write down what we had before. One on two t naught minus t to the one half I had times one on square root two t0, and that now I replace f0 nu uh, by h times uh, 2t0, and let's see what we finally got. Um, what did I do here? Does this look right? Um, I'm left with square root of 2t0 divided by square root of 2t0 uh, minus t times the times a minus sign times h and this is just the mean but this is the h uh, of um, of the initial surface of f0 at p now if I, since I have rescaled this by this factor, the mean curvature with exact the opposite factor is of course equal to the mean curvature at f of p of t. So we find that the normal component of the uh, speed is equal to the mean curvature. So f solves mean curvature flow up to tangential diffeomorphisms. Okay, so in other words, this equation here characterizes self-similar shrinking solutions. Right? So this equation star, star characterizes self-similar Shrinking solutions. And it's clear that we cannot expect that this is true um, without allowing tangential diffeomorphisms, right? Because if you're here on the cylinder and, and the sh 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 cylinder is shrinking, and you study this from this point x naught here, then of course here the shrinking in this direction is exactly um, the same as mean curvature flow, but of course the shrinking from this point here or from this point, it's only the normal component of the shrinking is uh, giving you mean curvature flow 
uh, so that's why it's important that I have to multiply this with nu. Only then you see the mean curvature. So this <coughs> rescaled surface is, of course, not. Um, it has a very strong tangential component, as you can see in this picture, where you have the shrinking cylinder. Nevertheless, the flow, this monotonicity formula, has the capability of singling out the uh, self-similar solutions. And so the question is, are there more such self-similar solutions? So here are some other examples. And uh, it turns out for n equals 1, so just a curve in the plane, uh, there, there was a whole family discovered. There's a circle, of course, which we just found already. And then there's a family of curves look like that. And then it's getting more complicated. And there's a two-parameter family of curves that all satisfy this equation. You see, when you write it down for a curve, this is just <coughs> the curvature of the curve. So this, in, if you write it in angular coordinates, this is just a second-order ODE for the uh, position of the curve in the plane. And then you can always solve it for some initial conditions, but then the, the, the solution will just uh, chaotically run around. And if you do it just right, you get a <coughs> discrete family of parameters where uh, the curve nicely closes up. And that gives you uh, this uh, family of curves, which was found uh, by Abrecht and Langer. And then I think it took about six or seven years until people discovered that Malin had studied this about 25 years earlier in the context of crystal growth and found these uh, uh, curves already. Uh, in higher dimensions, there is a, a whole bunch of these self-similar solutions which are axially symmetric. So I just draw the profile of uh, these axially symmetric solutions. So here's the radius of these curves. And then, of course, you have the uh, sphere. You have the cylinder. And then it turns out there is a embedded torus, sort of an oval-shaped cross-section, uh, which was found by Sigurd Anginent. And that's why it's called the Anginent torus. Again, it's a matter of finding the right initial conditions for the resulting ODE in the axial symmetric case and make it close up. And then there are these pictures very similar to these ones. There's a curve like this. And then it turns horrible. You know, you can, you can have essentially, there are pictures that look like that. <laughs> so you have all sorts of immersed tori. And then there are some which hit the axis. So there is a huge variety of axially symmetric self-similar solutions. I should point out, however, uh, these are the only embedded ones up to here. And um, so these guys are embedded. And these ones here are the only ones with positive mean curvature. So all these on this side, all this junk is uh, <coughs> either has not positive mean curvature or, in fact, it's not even embedded. So you would not expect these guys to appear as singularity models. They would be extremely unstable. So the really interesting ones are those three. And then there are others. <coughs> I'm unable to draw them, but um, imagine a cube, punch a hole through in all three axes, and make it into a smooth surface what is left over. And then you get a surface with, a, with this uh, cubical symmetry. And in fact, uh, someone showed numerically that you can solve this elliptic equation uh, on such a surface. So there are embedded, complicated surfaces in R3 that move under self-similarities and move 
under this uh, shrinking equations. So that, but again, you would expect that kind of thing to be very unstable. Now, uh, there's another way of thinking about this, because, <clears throat> see, this weight here is uh, uh, rather precise, um, but I'll come back to that later. We can, in fact, interpret these surfaces here as minimal surfaces in a funny metric coming from this Gaussian kernel. And then this would be, say, the equator in a sphere, and this would look like the Clifford torus or so. So there's a way of thinking about these surfaces as minimal surfaces just in a funny metric, where this uh, thing here comes from a conformal factor. But the most important uh, application of the monotonicity formula is that it allows you to understand the shape of singularities. And this only works if you do a rescaling procedure. So I have to tell you about the rescaling procedure for the uh, mean curvature flow. And uh, uh, let's see. There's two ways to do rescaling. So first attempt. And uh, you see, <coughs> here, for the self-similar solutions, we have rescaled with this factor here. And we found, found this, this uh, we've rescaled the initial surface, we found the solution. So now suppose we have a um, singularity. <coughs> Assume that mean curvature flow forms a singularity that is similar, I will tell you in a moment, to uh, spheres, cylinders, and all these pictures here. Then th we should rescale, if this is the case, the right rate that we, the right magnification rate that we should put on our microscope <coughs> should, should be uh, exactly this factor. Just we do it now the other way around, right? We want to rescale with this factor to the power minus one half as t approaches t zero and T0 is the singular time. This is our old T max, the singular time. What? We have a singular time, and by the way, singularities uh, can happen, as um, Carlo told you yesterday. Recall, there are these singularities that come from convex surfaces, and we expect that if we train our microscope in the right way, that we see the shrinking spheres. And he also showed to you this argument with a barrier argument that you get a shrinking uh, neck in here. And, uh, and we expect that if we tr train our microscope on this region, that if we do this, we somehow should find the shrinking uh, cylinder. Right, this is the picture. And what we want to find out is uh, how general is that? But, but if the picture is right, then we should rescale with this a quantity. So the ansatz is <coughs> to set given f from mn from 0 to t0 to rn plus 1 
uh, set um, <coughs> f tilde of uh, p and t to be uh, this factor t <coughs> two t zero minus one to the minus one half. Right? We are blowing up. This is if t is very close to t naught, this will be a huge factor times the uh, um, times the uh, f of p of t. Um, if we expect the singularity at the origin. Expect singularity at x naught equals zero. Otherwise, I would take here minus x naught, right? But let's make things simple. Rescale around the origin. <coughs> And then it turns out best to introduce a new time parameter. S, and I uh, have to get the constant right, S is equal to minus logarithm of 2 t naught minus t to the one half. So as uh, t approaches t naught, this goes to zero, and minus the logarithm goes to plus infinity. You see, it's much better. We want to study now the asymptotics after we rescale. And to understand the asymptotics, it's better to make the time interval infinitely long. And it turns out the constants are j just chosen such that if you now take the derivative of f hat, the rescale thing, with respect to the s variable, just do the computation, it turns out you get, from here it just scales right, um, the mean curvature vector of the rescaled surface, but then you get an extra term from this front thing, and this extra term is simply f hat at PS. You know, if, if this is not there, this is the pure rescaling, right? If, if the mean curvature wasn't there, this is pure rescaling pushing the things up. So this is one way to rescale the flow. And notice that, of course, the fixed points of this new form, uh, flow, fixed points uh, satisfy Uh, in particular, that uh, if you multiply with the unit normal, that uh, h, so if you have um, fixed points in normal direction, so dds f had um, <coughs> normal component, if you want that to be zero, Right? We always have to work modulate the tangential motion, so we only want the normal component to be zero. And then this just means that you get um, uh, minus h, because mean curvature vector is minus h times nu, so you get minus h plus uh, f hat dot nu uh, equal to zero. And this is exactly the equation star as before. So we have indeed created now by this rescaling a flow such that the condition that gives us the self-similar shrinking solutions are exactly the fixed points of this new flow. And then <coughs> when you compute what is now, now let's see what the monotonicity formula is telling us in this setting. Well. If you set, well, let's just compute it, d dt rho d mu over mn, this is uh, equal to 1 on 4 pi t naught minus t uh, to the n over 2, right, uh, times e to the um, 
minus uh, f uh, <coughs> uh, squared divided by 4 t naught minus t uh, times d mu. Now, the d mu multiplied with this factor is exactly the rescaled d mu up to a 1 over 2 pi to the n over 2. Uh, this is just the rescaled d mu hat. And this thing here over 4 to naught minus 2 is just the rescaled e to the yeah, I need more space, e to the minus f hat squared over 2 uh, d mu hat over the surface mn hat. T. So by with this rescaling procedure, our weighted integral has just become an integral of the Gaussian a fixed function which does no longer even depend on the parameter s or t. Right? We have become, we've really gotten the Gaussian integral up to a constant. And then when you compute now under this new evolution equation, what is dds of um, integral mn s of e to the minus x squared over 2 d mu, uh, it turns out you get um, uh, you get a minus integral mns of uh, mean curvature uh, hat um, um, here um, minus f hat nu squared uh, e to the minus x squared over 2 d mu. Uh, are the integrals supposed to be over mn hat or over mn hat? mn hat of s. Well, mn of s, yeah, you can put a hat if you like. This, these are the rescaled surfaces, right? And the time parameter is now s. But now the time runs Note that S runs between um, the time when you had uh, T equals zero, so this is a minus log of um, <coughs> uh, two T naught to the one half, which is some number, but it runs all the way to plus infinity. So if rescaling produces a smooth limit, then this smooth limit must satisfy our crucial equation. Right? So, so if we get a smooth limiting surface, then it must Satisfy H equals F dot nu. In, in other words, any such limiting surface, uh, it must give rise a self similar shrinking solution. So the question is. Under what condition can we produce that smooth limit? Yes. Sorry. This is the rescaled measure. Uh, yes. Everything is. Uh, no, no, no. This is just the. This is just now. Now, now I'm back on on Euclidean space. This is just dx, if you like. This is just the ordinary, the induced metric on this surface. Yeah, I should write d mu, d mu s on this surface. Well, 
right? Because I here, this, this together times d mu gives this measure. Because the, the measure scales like distance to the n, right? And here I have rescaled distance. Where is it? Here, here. I've rescaled distance with this factor. So the measure rescales with, the, this, with this factor to the n. And this is exactly this term here. OK, so the issue is, when do we get this limit? Well, we, when do we get a limit? When do we, if we can bound the curvature, right? So we need the curvature to be bounded. So what happens to the curvature under this rescaling? Well, the rescaling, the curvature scales exactly the other way around. So what we need is that the curvature, as we approach the singularity, behaves like the curvature of a sphere or a cylinder. So need for this that the soap of the second fundamental form as m and t approaches t, uh, <coughs> the final time, that this is less than some constant divided by t naught minus t. as t approaches t naught. So it's allowed to go to infinity, but only at this rate. Or another way of putting it, of course, is that the soup of a squared times t naught minus t, m and t is less than c, less than infinity. And <coughs> if we have this, make this assumption, if this is true, this, this condition here is called, it's a type one singularity. If this condition is satisfied, we call the singularity a type one singularity. So the shrinking spheres, all these things that have been there on the board, all these pictures are type one singularities because they have, they are self-similar shrinking solutions. And of course, for the shrinking solutions, if they self similar, the second fundamental form it, it, it clearly satisfies this. In fact, this is constant along because it's just shrinking. Now, if this is true, then we know that from such a curvature estimate, we get higher derivative estimates. So <coughs> this means, of course, that the A hat squared is bounded by C because the A hat squared is exactly this quantity. So in fact, this is the same. And then we know that if this curvature is bounded, we, can, we know how to do this. All the higher derivatives will also be bounded. So we have curvature bounds, we have gradient of curvature bounds, and we have, very important, we have some volume bound here. This, right, this is, this is sort of the, it's a weighted volume, but still, it's a positive density everywhere on Rn plus one. So this means if our initial surface is compact, this was finite, it is decreasing, so these surfaces cannot pile up, okay? We cannot get high densities, so no, we have no compilation. Since integral rho d mu s over m n s is less than, inf less than this integral over the initial surface, Now, the only thing that could still go wrong is that the surface disappears. And in fact, if I choose my point for rescaling, 
here, if I'm stupid enough to rescale around that point, of course this whole thing will just shoot out to infinity and disappear in the never-never. And all these curvature estimates are useless because I get nice surfaces, but they all disappear. Okay? But this is easily fixed. Either I recognize my mistake and I just translate it back to go through the origin, or in fact you can see that if you really approach this point uh, with the singularity, then because you have a type 1 singularity, the mean curvature, which is the speed, goes like 1 over the square root of this, and 1 over the square root of this is uh, integrable, and therefore it cannot move arbitrarily fast, even if you push out with this rescaling, so you get a limit. So let me just write, it does not disappear uh, <coughs> by choosing good rescaling point. Okay? And then you get, as, of course, whether you have a unique limit, or no, no claims, but now with this control, you can show that you get a subsequence which converges smoothly to one of these solutions of the self-similarity equation. So let's collect that in a theorem. Any <coughs> type 1 singularity of mean curvature flow can be rescaled to yield a self-similar shrinking solution of mean curvature flow. Okay, so that's the first classification of singularities that you get out of the uh, monotonicity formula. Those of you who studied minimal surfaces, the comparison, you can view this as a parabolic cone. In minimal surface theory, you have a monotonicity formula. It's essentially the same one, except that h is zero, the formula, which tells you if you rescale a singularity, you see a cone, a minimal cone. Here, we see a self-similar shrinking solution of mean curvature flow. It's the, mean, it's the parabolic analog of the minimal cone uh, theorem for singularities of minimal surfaces. Right. Uh, can one classify these self-similar solutions? I've drawn this picture telling you that in general probably it's, it's rather hopeless. What I can tell you is there's a theorem that I proved long time ago that if the mean curvature is positive and if it's self-similar shrinking, then it is one of the following. Well, first of all, you have Sn, the shrinking sphere. Secondly, you can have Sn minus k cross Rk, a shrinking cylinder. And the only other possibility is the very special case coming from the Arbor Schlanger Mullins solution. You can have one of these curves of Mullins and Arbor Schlanger gamma mal. Yeah, they're bad curves. Cross Rn minus 1. And of course, these are ruled out. This, is, this case does not occur if you're in the embedded setting. Right? There's no such thing in the embedded setting. Right, so this, this I proved first around, I think it was around 1990, uh, for bounded curvature. 
and I think it was proven by uh, calling Minikossi in the most general setting. around uh, 2016 or so, without assuming bounded curvature. Now, uh, okay. Right, so this is the, uh, all right, I think I should tell you one more. There's one more very recent result, which is also very nice. So there was a result a theorem by Brentle. Brentle 2017, I think, where he showed that if M2 is sitting in R3, closed, embedded, and self-similar, Then M2, ah, embedded, self-similar, and M2 diffeomorphic to, this, to the sphere. If it's simply connected, then it is the sphere. <coughs> of some radius. It's a remarkable result because he does not assume any curvature assumption. So he replaces positive mean curvature by embeddedness and the fact and the topological condition. Right? He uses a topological condition and the spherical and the embeddedness. I, showed you, I, I told you about this cube with the three holes punched through. That's an embedded surface and it's a self-shrinker. At least uh, it exists numerically. So this topology condition is absolutely necessary, and the embeddedness condition is also necessary because we've seen uh, all these other, uh, but the engine in Taurus also shows you that the topological condition is necessary. And uh, this gives some hope, right? Uh, if you cannot show that for these types of surfaces in R3, uh, there's no type two singularity, no other singularity than the ones we've discussed so far. And we know the uh, surface we start with a sphere, then it must, the solution must exist until it has shrunk down to a nice round sphere. And that means you can deform with mean curvature flow any embedded two sphere in R3 into a round sphere. <laughs> with this PDE. And this would be a complete reproof of PDE methods <coughs> of Hatcher's theorem, a famous theorem in topology. Can one, so this is an open problem. Can we use mean curvature flow to give a completely new proof of this famous theorem in topology that embedded two spheres you know, the J Jordan curve uh, theorem, one dimension higher. <coughs> it, at the moment, it still seems out of reach, but this is a hint that we may have a chance. The way Brentle proved this is he saw that the self-similar solutions, this equation here, <coughs> so the, the main idea, there were many ideas, but the main idea here was that the, the equation H equals F dot nu is the Euler-Lagrange equation for the weighted area, for, for integral e to the minus x squared for two dm. What? If you compute the Euler-Lagrange equation for a hypersurface and you want to locally minimize this with this weight, 
you end up exactly with this uh, equation. But this here is just the area with respect to a, and I shouldn't use head, maybe I use double tilde, of a, this is just the ordinary area with respect to a, a conformal metric on Rn plus one, you take the standard metric times E to the minus x squared over 2n. You take this conformal factor, then this area becomes this weighted ordinary area. And therefore, this here is the minimal surface operator in this metric. So self-similar <coughs> solutions are minimal surfaces with respect to this metric G double tilde. And then you have the whole power of geometric measure theory, for example, to attack this and check whether you can really have a minimal surface of type S2 in uh, R3 with this funny metric. Okay. okay. Now, yes? Uh, I come to that in a, a second. Uh, next thing is translating solutions. So, yeah. <clears throat> just have to remember your question. Okay, so this is rescaling first attempt. So now comes rescaling second attempt. a type 1 solution, there has to be a type 2 solution. So we are not that lucky as in that uh, setup over there each time. So in case we don't know what the blow up rate is, we can still do something. Namely, we can do the following. We can just ask very generally, how can we rescale our flow? So given F mnt mn cross time interval into, yeah, let's do it in Rn plus one. I don't want to rescale the ambient manifold, which we could also do, but let's do it in Rn plus one. <coughs> then, and uh, given uh, time uh, T naught, where we want to rescale, and maybe a point a sequence of points, PI, uh, or events, TI, in MN cross zero T naught. Uh, can define some parameters lambda i bigger than zero, uh, f i, f, f, uh, f hat i of p and uh, tau, introduce a new time parameter tau again, and here we take lambda i, we multiply now with lambda i, and we take f at uh, p, and here we take uh, tau lambda i to the minus 2 plus ti, and uh, we subtract um, f at uh, 
PI TI. This is, this is what we do. So where does this uh, tau live? Well, the T's are these guys. So, <coughs> so here, this guy is T, <coughs> the old T. So the T was between zero and capital T. Then this no, new guy tau must be between um, minus ti lambda i squared, and it must be from above uh, less than uh, capital T minus ti times lambda i squared. Okay, this time interval. And the lambda i here and the lambda i to the minus 2 here are just chosen, right, so um, are just chosen in such a way that here, um, that if you compute dd tau of f hat i of p tau, then the uh, lambda i here times the inner derivative there uh, just fits together with the um, dfdt to give, um, I spare you the calculation, just this, you just get the mean curvature vector back again at p and tau. In other words, this is a rescaling where I really rescale now in some sense, more carefully. Here I've rescaled sort of just the space and then I introduced a slightly stretched time variable. Here, I don't try to do it all at once. I just take at each time a factor, lambda i, and rescale the space and I rescale time. And at the same time, I'm shifting the time a little bit such that my new tau equals zero is at the selected times ti, and that my new value at tau equals zero is exactly the origin. All right, so I've shifted space and time to make it convenient to make the point zero, zero in space time special. <coughs> but I've got, again, a solution of mean curvature flow. I don't have an extra term. So in some sense, this is the cleaner, the fairer way of rescaling the thing. You have mean curvature flow again. In other words, this is I'm really just, I just multiplied everything by a factor lambda i, space and time. And now, now the question is, how do I choose? How do I choose the uh, lambda i's? How do I choose my microscope? Well, I want to see something which is uh, non-trivial but smooth. So I have to rescale <coughs> sufficiently strong, but if I rescale too strong, I just see a plane. I just uh, see a flat surface. So I have to choose the size just right and the right thing to rescale seems to be just opposite to the curvature. So choose, <coughs> can choose lambda i to be the soup of the curvature. Uh, yeah, soup of the curvature on the surface cross the time interval uh, from zero to, well, I want to go a little bit beyond ti. So let's go to t plus t minus ti over two. So this is somewhere between halfway between ti and the end of my time interval, t, uh, or t naught, sorry, I should take here, t naught. This is the point around which I want to rescale, right? Yeah. Here, this is the end of my time interval where I have the singularity. And uh, if I do that, then I get 
first of all, that the um, rescaled surfaces have bounded curvature, then the uh, AI is bounded by uh, 1 on Mn cross the time interval up to uh, a little bit uh, beyond um, this Ti, so I go to uh, what uh, tau, tau, tau is equal to um, tau is equal to uh, T minus Ti times lambda i to the uh, 2. So um, if I put uh, 2, if t is less than ti plus this, this is less than lambda i squared up to uh, t. Uh, if I subtract ti from this, I get t naught minus ti over 2. T naught minus Ti over 2. Okay, I get the bound on this set. And um, which in turn is, uh, oops, I forgot the, yeah, lambda um, times lambda i squared, not really, of course, sorry. Lambda i squared. <coughs> and I get that f of um, pi ti, if I put ti in here, uh, uh, f, f of p of, of, of tau equals zero, had, if I put tau zero here, I get f of pi ti, this goes out to zero. And uh, I also get that the second fundamental form uh, um, at, right, I, right so, so I've shifted everything to zero, and if, if I want to, I could have rotated the thing also, um, so you could think of the surface somehow sitting around the origin in Rn plus one, and uh, <coughs> at time, Somehow we have rescaled this thing, and it looks like that, okay? And uh, since these guys are bounded, yet I can also get, after rescaling, I get all the derivatives of the AIs bounded by some other constant depending on n. And therefore I can use, since I've tra translated everything, and again, since I have area estimates, it is not so hard, you have to work a little bit, but it's not so hard that again you get a subsequence which converges as i tends to infinity, get a limiting mean curvature flow. <coughs> Surfaces um, <coughs> m infinity n of uh, t or tau, I should call them. And they solve mean curvature flow again. And on what time interval? Well, now, what happens to this time interval? Here's this time interval. Now, since we run into a singularity, we know at the singularity can, we can pick, 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 pick the events such that the uh, second fundamental form goes to infinity, right? That was our theorem in the first lecture. If we have uh, the uh, uh, singularity, then the curvature has to become unbounded, so the lambda i's tend to infinity, the ti's go to capital T, so this thing here certainly goes to minus infinity. So we certainly get a solution that has existed for all negative times. Now, what about here? Now, now it, all of a sudden it makes a difference whether we have a type 1 singularity or not. 
You see, this lambda i, if we choose the maximum of the curvature at, on intervals that get closer and closer to the singular time t naught. So if we have a type 1 singularity, then we know that these guys remain bounded. So we get that this is less than some t max, less than infinity, if the singularity is of type 1, but we get a solution on minus infinity up to plus infinity if the solution is not type 1. Well, if it's not type 1, people call it type 2. The curve, well, the way I have chosen here, this interval here, see, see this interval also, if it's a type 2 singularity, this, the one half doesn't uh, destroy this, this has to go to infinity. So get, I get my curvature bound on arbitrarily large time intervals. So I really get a completely smooth solution of mean curvature flow, which exists all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. So that, that's the advantage of the second approach. We can still do type 1, then we get a solution that exists from minus infinity to some finite time. Well, this is the convex case, right? Type 1, you have this convex surface, you rescale, and you get a sphere that comes from huge radius, time minus infinity, and it contracts to a point at some finite time. Or if you have a cylinder or a neck pinch, if you have this neck, and you rescale here, and you see this cylinder coming from a huge radius at time minus infinity, and it converges to this line at a finite time. So this is this picture, finite time. But then, it turns out there are some other singularities which are of type 2 and which can be rescaled uh, to exist, to have a solution on infinite time. What could that be? Examples. Example of type 2 singularity. First example is if you have a curve like this, a double loop. And if you let that shrink, what happens is that, well, the small loop shrinks faster than the big loop, and you develop a cusp rather than a neck. This is in the case n equals 1, a curve in the plane. And when you put the microscope on this thing here, What you see is a solution here is y and here is uh, x and uh, here is uh, pi over 2 and here is minus pi over 2 and you get a solution that is asymptotic to these two lines and looks like that. And it just moves by translation. So m infinity uh, 1 moves by translation. And in fact, you can give a formula. You get that x uh, is equal to x at t is equal to uh, 
x at t and y is equal to um, minus log cosine y uh, plus t. So it translates with speed one from right to left. And therefore, of course, it exists on minus infinity less than t less than infinity. You get, you get a solution for all time because you get a translating solution. Now, the second example where something like this happens is if you try to do this neck pinch picture that we had before, but now you do it in such a way that the bubble on the right is not so big, but also not so small. If this was a very small bubble, then it would just sort of shoot inside. The surface becomes convex, and then we get a singularity like this. If the bubble on the right-hand side is much bigger, then we get a nice neck pinch in the cylinder like that. But if you choose the size of the second bubble just right, then what happens is it gets stuck. It gets stuck in here and forms again a cusp. And when you point the microscope, this rescaling procedure that I explained at the tip of the cusp, then you see again something like this looks like a parabola, grows like a parameter. It looks like a parabola, grows like a parabola, but is not a parabola. But it moves by translation again. So this is a bowl moving by translation. Now, there's one thing I didn't stress. It's inherent in what I wrote down. You have to pick a sequence of points. What I've shown you so far in all the, is assuming I have a sequence of points which actually goes to the point where the curvature is maximum, sort of a sequence of points sitting at the tip, sitting at the tip here. There's more subtlety, which I didn't have time to explain. But if you don't choose your points right, of course, you could see something else. If you choose your points where you rescale and do this procedure somewhat differently, then you might have rescaled a little bit next to the tip. And if you do that, then you see the cylinder again, which you see in the ordinary neck pinch. And of course, this is the cylinder that is attached to this parabola, right? If you go on a parabola far out to infinity and rescale, you get a cylinder. So <clears throat> this rescaling thing here is not a, it is extremely helpful uh, and it gives you a lot of information. Um, in particular, you get these self-similar solutions and you get these translating solutions. But it still depends a lot on how you do it, and you may see there's no uniqueness whatsoever. So you have to be extremely careful how you pick your sequence, what kind of limit you get, okay? But there are some theorems. For example, there's the theorem by Richard Hamilton, which says that an ancient solution which is convex and where the maximum of the mean curvature is attained, or the maximum of the second fundamental form, is a translating solution. not an ancient, an eternal, an eternal. These are 
These are all ancient solutions because they start at ancient times, but only the second one here is eternal. These names have all been made up by Richard Hamilton. Yeah. He loves giving these names, and I think they make sense. And uh, so, <coughs> in all this, this theorem applies in the two pictures I've shown you. You get a convex, of course, you have to prove that you get this convex solution here, or you get this convex solution there. There's a lot of work to do to, to prove that. But you can do that, and then you get this, extra, this solution. And of course, if we pick the points right, we can make sure that the maximum is attained here or there. And this theorem then says, yes, we got a translation solution. And now you have a complete picture. A set, not a complete picture, a set there, these subtleties. But now we have sort of a chance to understand singularities or rule out singularities. Because if we want to show, for example, that we have some, that the flow has beautiful properties and doesn't have singularities, now instead of analyzing mean curvature flow step by step and you know controlling every single little piece of the complicated surface, this theory says all you have to do is concentrate on the singular times. Just assume you have some singular time, and then you look, then, only then, you look at the microscope, and then you just have these two possibilities. Either you get a type one singularity, and then you know they are self-similar. This reduces your problem, for example, in the positive mean curvature flow, to just study these spheres and cylinders. Or you have a type two solution, and then you just have to analyze the translating solutions. And how that works, I'm going to show you in the next lecture, improving Grayson's theorem. So we will combine these techniques in a sketch of proof of Grayson's, Grayson's theorem. So next time, I'm going to prove the theorem by Matthew Grayson that if gamma zero is an embedded curve in R2, is embedded, then mean curvature flow, which is also called in this case curve shortening, uh, deforms uh, gamma zero to a tiny circle. So you get a proof, an analytic proof of the Jordan Kopf theorem. Any complicated, no matter how complicated curve in the Euclidean two space can be deformed with this flow until it's nice, small, and convex and shrinks to a point uh, exactly. In other words, the way we're going to prove it is I show you that the only singularity that can ever happen is this one. I don't, I'm not going to analyze what this curve is doing, how it is winding in R2. I'm just saying, if something goes wrong, something will go wrong because it's enclosed in some circle which dies eventually. If something goes wrong, this is the only way it can go wrong. And therefore, just before it go, went wrong, it must have been a tiny circle, and I'm done. So the whole thing of Grayson had a completely different proof where he really followed the curve and he counted how many turning points there are and so on and had a beautiful way of analyzing that. It was a fantastic paper. But you can do it this way. You don't, you don't have to do all that. You, you want to be lazy. You just look at the singularity and they say, this is the only singularity that's possible. Therefore, it must have unwinded. Okay, that's for tomorrow. <laughs>